A Call to Prayer by J.C. Ryle I have a question to offer you. It is contained in three words. Do you pray? The question is one that none but you can answer. Whether you attend public worship or not, your minister knows. Whether you have family prayers in your house or not, your relations know. But whether you pray in private or not is a matter between yourself and God. I beseech you in all affection to attend to the subject I bring before you. Do not say that my question is too close. If your heart is right in the sight of God, there is nothing in it to make you afraid. Do not turn off my question by replying that you say your prayers. It is one thing to say your prayers and another to pray. Do not tell me that my question is unnecessary. Listen to me for a few moments and I will show you good reasons for asking it. I ask whether you pray because prayer is absolutely needful to a man's salvation. I say absolutely needful and I say so advisedly. I am not speaking now of infants and idiots. I am not settling the state of the heathen. I know that where little is given, there little will be required. I speak especially of those who call themselves Christian in a land like our own. And of such I say, no man or woman can expect to be saved who does not pray. I hold salvation by grace as strongly as anyone. I would gladly offer a free and full pardon to the greatest sinner that ever lived. I would not hesitate to stand by his dying bed and say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ even now, and you shall be saved. But that a man can have salvation without asking for it, I cannot see in the Bible. That a man will receive pardon of his sins, who will not so much as lift up his heart inwardly and say, Lord Jesus, give it to me, this I cannot find. I can find that nobody will be saved by his prayers, but I cannot find that without prayer anybody will be saved. It is not absolutely necessary to salvation that a man should read the Bible. A man may have no learning or be blind and yet have Christ in his heart. It is not absolutely needful that a man should hear a public preaching of the gospel. He may live where the gospel is not preached or he may be bedridden or deaf. But the same thing cannot be said about prayer. It is absolutely needful to salvation that a man should pray. There is no royal road either to health or learning. Princes and kings, poor men and peasants, all alike must attend to the wants of their own bodies and their own minds. No man can eat, drink, or sleep by proxy. No man can get the alphabet learned for him by another. All these are things which everybody must do for himself, or they will not be done at all. Just as it is with the mind and body, so it is with the soul. There are certain things absolutely needful to the soul's health and well-being. Each must attend to these things for himself. Each must repent for himself. Each must apply to Christ for himself. And for himself each must speak to God and pray. You must do it for yourself, for by nobody else can it be done. To be prayerless is to be without God, without Christ, without grace, without hope, and without heaven. It is to be on the road to hell. Now, can you wonder that I ask the question, do you pray? I ask again whether you pray because a habit of prayer is one of the surest marks of a true Christian. All the children of God on earth are alike in this respect. From the moment there is any life in reality about their religion, they pray. Just as the first sign of life in an infant when born into the world is the act of breathing, so the first act of men and women when they are born again is praying. This is one of the common marks of all the elect of God. They cry unto him day and night. Luke 18 verse 1 The Holy Spirit who makes them new creatures works in them the feeling of adoption and makes them cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8:15. The Lord Jesus, when he quickens them, gives them a voice and a tongue and says to them, Be dumb no more. God has no dumb children. 
it is as much a part of their new nature to pray as it is of a child to cry. They see their need of mercy and grace. They feel their emptiness and weakness. They cannot do otherwise than they do. They must pray. I have looked carefully over the lives of God's saints in the Bible. I cannot find one of whose history much is told us from Genesis to Revelation who was not a man of prayer. I find it mentioned as a characteristic of the godly that they call on the Father, 1 Peter 1, verse 17, or the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Recorded as characteristic of the wicked is the fact that they call not upon the Lord, Psalm 14, verse 4. I have read the lives of many eminent Christians who have been on earth since the Bible days. Some of them, I see, were rich and poor. Some were learned and some unlearned. Some of them were Episcopalians and some Christians of other names. Some were Calvinists and some were Arminians. Some have loved to use a liturgy and some to use none. But one thing I see they all had in common. They have all been men of prayer. I study the reports of missionary societies in our own times. I see with joy the heathen men and women are receiving the gospel in various parts of the globe. There are conversions in Africa, in New Zealand, in Hindustan, and in China. The people converted are naturally unlike one another in every respect. But one striking thing I observe in all the missionary stations, the converted people always pray. I do not deny that a man may pray without heart and without sincerity. I do not for a moment pretend to say that the mere fact that a person's praying proves everything about his soul. As in every other part of religion, so also in this, there may be deception and hypocrisy. But this I do say, that not praying is a clear proof that a man is not yet a true Christian. He cannot really feel his sins. He cannot love God. He cannot feel himself a debtor to Christ. He cannot long after holiness. He cannot desire heaven. He has yet to be born again. He has yet to be made a new creature. He may boast confidently of election, grace, faith, hope, knowledge, and deceive ignorant people. But you may rest assured it is all vain talk if he does not pray. And I say furthermore that of all the evidences of the real work of the Spirit, a habit of hearty private prayer is one of the most satisfactory that can be named. A man may preach from false motives. A man may write books and make fine speeches and seem diligent in good works and yet be a Judas Iscariot. But a man seldom goes into his closet and pours out his soul before God in secret unless he is in earnest. The Lord himself has set his stamp on prayer as the best proof of a true conversion. When he set Ananias to Saul in Damascus, he gave him no other evidence of his change of heart than this, Behold, he prayeth. Acts 9, verse 11. I know that much may go on in a man's mind before he is brought to pray. He may have many convictions, desires, wishes, feelings, intentions, resolutions, hopes and fears but all these things are very uncertain evidences they are to be found in ungodly people and often come to nothing in many a case they are not more lasting than the morning cloud and the dew that passeth away a real hearty prayer coming from a broken and contrite spirit is worth all these things put together I know that the Holy Spirit who calls sinners from their evil ways does in many instances lead them by very slow degrees to acquaintance with Christ. But the eye of man can only judge by what it sees. I cannot call anyone justified until he believes. I dare not say that anyone believes until he prays. I cannot understand a dumb faith. The first act of faith will be to speak to God. Faith is to the soul what life is to the body. Prayer is to faith what breath is to life. 
how a man can live and not breathe is past my comprehension, and how a man can believe and not pray is past my comprehension too. Never be surprised if you hear ministers of the gospel dwelling much on the importance of prayer. This is the point we want to bring to you. We want to know that you pray. Your views on doctrine may be correct. Your love of Protestantism may be warm and unmistakable. But still, this may be nothing more than head knowledge and party spirit. We want to know whether you are actually acquainted with the throne of grace and whether you can speak to God as well as you speak about God. Do you wish to find out whether you are a true Christian? Then rest assured that my question is of the very first importance. Do you pray? I ask whether you pray because there is no duty in religion so neglected as private prayer. We live in days of abounding religious profession. There are more places of public worship now than there ever were before. There are more persons attending them than there were ever before. And yet in spirit of all this public religion, I believe there is a vast neglect of private prayer. It is one of those private transactions between God and our souls which no eyes see, and therefore one which men are tempted to pass over and leave undone. I believe that thousands never utter a word of private prayer at all. They eat, they drink, they sleep, they rise, they go forth to their labor, they return to their homes, they breathe God's air, they see God's sun, they walk on God's earth, they enjoy God's mercies, they have dying bodies, they have judgment and eternity before them, but they never speak to God. They live like the beasts that perish, they behave like creatures without souls, they have not one word to say to him in whose hand are their life and breath, and all things and from whose mouth they must one day receive their everlasting sentence. How dreadful this seems, but if the secrets of men were only known, how common. I believe there are tens of thousands whose prayers are nothing but a mere form, a set of words repeated by rote, without a thought about their meaning. Some say over a few hasty sentences picked up in the nursery when they were children. Some content themselves with repeating the creed, forgetting that there is not a request in it. Some add the Lord's Prayer, but without the slightest desire that its solemn petitions may be granted. Many even of those who use good forms mutter their prayers after they have gotten into bed and while they wash or dress in the morning. Men may think what they please, but they may depend upon that in the sight of God. This is not praying. Words said without heart are as utterly useless to our souls as the drum beating of the poor heathen before their idols. Where there is no heart, there may be lip work and tongue work, but there is nothing that God listens to. There is no prayer. Saul, I have no doubt, said many a long prayer before the Lord met him on the way to Damascus, but it was not till his heart was broken that the Lord said, He prayeth. Does this surprise you? Listen to me, and I will show you that I am not speaking as I do without reason. Do you think that my assertions are extravagant and unwarrantable? Give me your attention, and I will soon show you that I am only telling you the truth. Have you forgotten that it is not natural to anyone to pray? The carnal mind is enmity against God. The desires of man's heart is to get far away from God and have nothing to do with Him. His feeling towards Him is not love but fear. Why then should a man pray when he has no real sense of sin, no real feeling of spiritual wants, no thorough belief in unseen things, no desire after holiness, and heaven. Of all these things the vast majority of men know and feel nothing. The multitude walk in the broad way. I cannot forget this. Therefore, I say boldly, I believe that few pray. Have you forgotten that it is not fashionable to pray? It is one of the things that many would be rather ashamed to own. 
There are hundreds who would sooner storm a beach or lead a forlorn hope than confess publicly that they make a habit of prayer. There are thousands who, if obliged to sleep in the same room with a stranger, would lie down in bed without a prayer. To dress well, to go to theaters, to be thought clever and agreeable, all this is fashionable, but not to pray. I cannot forget this. I cannot think a habit is common which so many seem ashamed to own. I believe that few pray. Have you forgotten the lives that many live? Can we really believe that people are praying against sin night and day when we see them plunging into it? Can we suppose they pray against the world when they are entirely absorbed and taken up with its pursuits? Can we think they really ask God for grace to serve Him when they do not show the slightest desire to serve Him at all? Oh, no. It is plain as daylight that the great majority of men either ask nothing of God or do not mean what they say when they do ask, which is just the same thing. Praying and sinning will never live together in the same heart. Prayer will consume sin or sin will choke prayer. I cannot forget this. I look at men's lives. I believe that few pray. Have you forgotten the deaths that many die? How many, when they draw near death, seem entirely strangers to God? Not only are they sadly ignorant of his gospel, but sadly wanting in the power of speaking to him. There is a terrible awkwardness and shyness in their endeavors to approach him. They seem to be taking up a fresh thing. They appear as if they wanted an introduction to God and as if they had never talked with him before. I remember having heard of a lady who was anxious to have a minister to visit her in her last illness. She desired that he would pray with her. He asked her what he should pray for. She did not know and could not tell. She was utterly unable to name any one thing which she wished him to ask God for her soul. All she seemed to want was the form of a minister's prayer. I can quite understand this. Deathbeds are great revealers of secrets. I cannot forget what I have seen of sick and dying people. This also leads me to believe that few pray. I cannot see your heart. I do not know your private history in spiritual things. But from what I see in the Bible and in the world, I am certain I cannot ask you a more necessary question than that before you. Do you pray? I ask whether you pray because prayer is an act in religion to which there is great encouragement. There is everything on God's part to make prayer easy if men will only attempt it. All things are ready on his side. Every objection is anticipated. Every difficulty is provided for. The crooked places are made straight and the rough places are made smooth. There is no excuse left for the prayerless man. There is a way by which any man, however sinful and unworthy, may draw near to God the Father. Jesus Christ has opened the way by the sacrifice he made for us upon the cross. The holiness and justice of God need not frighten sinners and keep them back. Only let them cry to God in the name of Jesus. Only let them plead the atoning blood of Jesus, and they shall find God upon a throne of grace, willing and ready to hear. The name of Jesus is a never-failing passport for our prayers. In that name a man may draw near to God with boldness and ask with confidence. God has engaged to hear him. Think of this. Is not this encouragement? There is an advocate, an intercessor, always waiting to present the prayers of those who come to God through him. That advocate is Jesus Christ. He mingles our prayers with the incense of his own almighty intercession. So mingled, they go up as a sweet savor before the throne of God. Poor as they are in themselves, they are mighty and powerful in the hand of our high priest and elder brother. The bank note without a signature at the bottom is nothing but a worthless piece of paper. The stroke of a pen confers on it all its value. 
The prayer of a poor child of Adam is a feeble thing in itself, but once endorsed by the hand of the Lord Jesus, it availeth much. There was an officer in the city of Rome who was appointed to have his doors always open in order to receive any Roman citizen who applied to him for help. Just so the ear of the Lord Jesus is ever open to the cry of all who want mercy and grace. It is his office to help them. Their prayer is his delight. Think of this. Is not this encouragement? There is the Holy Spirit ever ready to help our infirmities in prayer. It is one part of his special office to assist us in our endeavors to speak with God. We need not be cast down and distressed by the fear of not knowing what to say. The Spirit will give us words if we seek his aid. The prayer of the Lord's people are the inspiration of the Lord's Spirit, the work of the Holy Ghost who dwells within them as the Spirit of grace and supplication. Surely the Lord's people may well hope to be heard. It is not they merely that pray, but the Holy Ghost pleading in them. Reader, think of this. Is not this encouragement? There are exceedingly great and precious promises to those who pray. What did the Lord Jesus mean when he spoke such words as these? Ask, and it shall be given to you, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Matthew 21, 22. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, verses 13 and 14. What did the Lord mean when he spoke the parables of the friend at midnight in the importunate widow, Luke chapter 11, verse 5, and chapter 18, verse 1? Think over these passages. If this is not encouragement to pray, words have no meaning. There are wonderful examples in Scripture of the power of prayer. Nothing seems to be too great, too hard, or too difficult for prayer to do. It has obtained things that seemed impossible and out of reach. It has won victories over fire, air, earth, and water. Prayer opened the Red Sea. Prayer brought water from the rock and bread from heaven. Prayer made the sun stand still. Prayer brought fire from the sky on Elijah's sacrifice. Prayer turned the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Prayer overthrew the army of Sennacherib. Well might Mary, Queen of Scots, say, I feared John Knox's prayer more than an army of ten thousand men.